Next, I will, I will pass the speaker to my colleague Tan Mei to make some introductions about his lecture and our speaker tonight. Thank you, David. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is Tan Mei. Um, so founded in 1964 as Goldberg Zoino and Associates Inc., uh, a soils and foundation specialty consultant, GZA Geo Environmental Inc. has grown into a full-service company, a multidisciplinary employee-owned firm, providing geotechnical, environmental, ecological, water, and construction management services. GZA's more than 700 professionals are based in offices in New England, the Mid-Atlantic, and the Great Lake states. Uh, the GZA lecture was established with the ASC Med Section Geotech Group in 2010 to promote developments and advances in the fields of geotechnical and foundation engineering and to explore technologies developed within our industry to meet the urban geotech foundation and construction challenges. Next slide, next slide please. Uh, here are some photos showcasing GZA's geotechnical uh, engineering and geotechnical instrumentation work. Uh, next slide, David. So today's lecture topic is considerations for mitigation of earthquake-induced soil liquefaction in urban environments. And I would like to welcome our speaker, Professor Shide Dashti. Uh, professor Dashti is an associate professor in geotechnical engineering and geomechanics at University of Colorado Boulder and the acting associate dean for research in the College of Engineering and Applied Science. She also directs a college-funded interdisciplinary research team titled RISE, which stands for Resilient Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity. Uh, professor Dashti obtained her undergrad degree at Cornell University and graduate degrees at University of California, Berkeley. She has worked briefly with Arup and Bechtel on several engineering projects. Uh, her research team at CU studies the interaction and interdependencies among infrastructure systems during earthquakes and other disaster, seismic performance of underground structures, consequences and mitigation of liquefaction hazard facing structures in urban settings, and the intersection of resilience, sustainability, and social justice. Uh, Professor Dashti is a recipient of the 2018 Arthur Casa Grand Award and 2021 Walter Huber Civil Engineering Research Prize from ASC, among other honors and recognition. Uh, and now we will hand it over to Professor Dashti for the lecture. All right, thank you so much, Tan Mei, for the introduction. Can you see my screen okay? We okay. don't see your screen yet. Oh. For me, it says it's showing, but let me see. I think it's fine. It's good on my end. Yeah. You can see? Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, all right, good evening. Thank you for joining this seminar. It's truly a pleasure to meet this audience virtually and, and have the conversation together about seismic interactions. Um, today, I'm going to present an overview of our team's research over the past decade or so on the response of buildings on liquefiable soils, particularly in the context of urban settings and ground improvement. And I very much look forward to a conversation together in the end uh, with feedback on future research needs and directions that serve you uh, in practice. But before I start, I would like to acknowledge the National Science Foundation for supporting the research I will present today, as well as Department of Education, Janus and Summit Supercomputing Facilities at CU Boulder, and my former postdoctoral scholars and graduate students working in this area, most notably uh, uh, doctors Peter Kirkwood, Zach Bullock, Balaji Paramasivam, and Yu Wei Huang, and uh, also two of my collaborators in structural engineering, professors Abby Lyle and Keith Porter. Uh, here's an outline of what I will uh, go over today um, as the background. Well, as you all know, I'm sure previous earthquakes have provided many examples of the effects of soil liquefaction on buildings that are on shallow foundations. And examples include excessive tilt and relative settlement of the foundation, which we continue to see extensively, even in the recent earthquake in, in Turkey. Um, or at times, their complete bearing capacity failure, like shown in this picture. Um, and one point I want to make here is that prior case histories have 
clearly shown over and over that soil response is different near structures compared to the free field that is away from structures or slopes. Soil structure interaction or SSI leads to different triggering potential as well as consequences in terms of settlement, lateral displacement and rotation near a structure when compared to the free field. So we cannot and should not use free field procedures near buildings. But these buildings are rarely found in isolation. There is evidence from prior cases, there is that interaction between and among structures in a cluster can strongly impact the magnitude and direction of the rotation. What we refer to as structure, soil structure interaction or triple SI. Um, Essentially, we have witnessed that taking into account SSI alone is not sufficient. And despite this evidence, these seismic interactions between and among structures in a cluster on liquefiable soils have not been studied much in the past. As a result, the existing methodologies for evaluating triggering, consequence, or mitigation typically ignore the structure altogether, so that is ignoring SSI, uh, or in the best case, assume isolation, basically consider SSI and not triple SI. And these approaches are not conservative, as we will see soon. Um, now, different researchers around the world have been studying the problem of seismic liquefaction from different angles using a variety of methodologies. And to address some of these problems related to uh, building response and seismic coupling specifically on liquefiable soils, in my team at the University of Colorado Boulder, we have adopted an integrated approach that essentially involves observational, experimental, numerical, and statistical modeling. This involves gathering and documenting case history observations of a given response or type of damage following an earthquake where there is evidence of liquefaction and ground failure, um, such as the recent earthquake in Turkey where we're deploying multiple teams from here as an example. In parallel, physical modeling either at 1G or increased gravity can be used to generate more case histories of a given physical response under controlled and simplistic conditions, which um, essentially help us evaluate the underlying mechanisms and validate our numerical tools uh, or, when appropriate, analytical models. And then after, after um, calibration and validation, numerical simulations, which may range greatly in degree of complexity, can be used in a parametric study to generate the data required for formulating statistical models of the main engineering demand parameters of interest. At the end of the day, though, any statistical model that is based on numerical or experimental models need to be validated and, if necessary, adjusted with case histories to cover the complexities of the field that are not necessarily captured in our simplistic models. So working with three different PhD students, we use this integrated approach to develop the first probabilistic procedures of building settlement and tilt that account for isolated SSI, this is isolated soil structure interaction, in 3D and all mechanisms of deformation as well as the total underlying uncertainties. So this is, I'm summarizing basically a research from the past. These models were developed based on more than 63,000 three-dimensional, fully coupled dynamic soil structure interaction, finite element simulations that were themselves validated with centrifuge experiments and adjusted with case history observations. These models are um, uh, fully probabilistic, so they can fit well within a performance-based design framework. And when used with our own ground motion prediction equations, they're appropriate for all tectonic environments. And I also want to add that we have extended these models recently to include liquefaction triggering uh, and densification within a unified probabilistic framework. And I've provided the citation for these models at the end of the presentation for those of you who are interested in, in using these in, in your projects. And we have developed spreadsheets um, that allow for an easy use in conjunction with SPT or CPT data and building properties to obtain essentially fragility curves 
for probability of exceeding a threshold settlement tilt or a combination of the two. Here, we can not only generate exceedance probability curves for settlement, residual tilt, and peak transient tilt, we can also look at tilt conditioned on some range of settlement. For example, how bad could tilt be if my settlement is below a certain threshold? This information could be quite useful in making decisions related to the need for liquefaction mitigation. So this is all great, at least an improvement over the prior state of practice that uh, for the most part completely ignored the building's presence um, or what I'm referring to as isolated SSI. But we knew that buildings are rarely built in isolation. We expect a strong effect from seismic coupling. Um, and uh, these, uh, these mechanisms of coupling and interaction are expected to influence building response. But the mechanisms and their effects on settlement and tilt have not been studied or sufficiently documented in order to be taken into account explicitly in our predictive models. And this consideration becomes especially important in planning mitigation in urban settings. You, you'll see why soon. Now, in the absence of uh, clear documentation of soil, foundation, and surrounding structures in urban case histories, particularly with mitigation, we designed a number of centrifuge experiments and numerical models to essentially shed light on the underlying mechanisms of triple SI on liquefiable soils and the role of mitigation. So I'm starting with the centrifuge uh, model description. If any of you are ever in the Denver area, I would uh, love to show you our centrifuge facilities at CU Boulder. This is the largest of three uh, 400 G-ton centrifuge facility with a radius of six meters. Um, in the first test series, we modeled unmitigated and mitigated potentially uh, inelastic structures with different properties um, that were placed on layered liquefiable soil deposits. Um, with sufficient spacing, these models were designed to represent isolated SSI conditions. Here, A and M in the top right um, means building type A. This is a three-story building with no mitigation. So NM stands for no mitigation. Same with B and M, referring to building B representing a nine-story building with no mitigation. One type of mitigation considered uh, and shown here in this picture was densification around the structure with dimensions designed based on the 98 Japanese Geotechnical Society recommendations. And we used other mitigation strategies as well, which I'll show in the next slides. Um, and the subsequent, so this is this test, these tests established isolated SSI. The subsequent tests were intended to establish a response and influence of triple SI, structure soil structure interaction, on two adjacent similar and dissimilar structures. So AA means two adjacent buildings like A with no mitigation, and BA means heavier structure B was next to a lighter building A with no mitigation. After establishing triple SI without mitigation, we considered both densification and prefabricated vertical drains of PBDs as two forms of ground improvement around one or both buildings. This is in the experiments. We considered these two forms uh, to start with because they sort of represent uh, important elements of many of our other traditional or modern mitigation methods through increasing soil dilative tendencies or increasing the rate of pore pressure dissipation. Um, here are the two types of moment resisting frame structures that I referred to as A and B. Uh, these were designed, simplified, and converted to model scale dimensions representing the properties that are listed in the table. But importantly, these buildings were designed with inelastic force deformation behaviors so we could capture any potential yielding or damage within the superstructure uh, which becomes important when we when we start to introduce ground improvement and um, at our facility um, at CU Boulder we have developed an automated pluviator which has significantly improved the accuracy 
uh, uniformity and repeatability of soil properties that can be achieved across the container. And here I'm showing the time lapse of one of the uh, model experiments to give you a feel for what, what they looked like and, and the, the, the students involved. Uh, we applied a sequence of motions in flight at the centrifugal acceleration of 70 g, but I will mostly focus on the results during the first major motion, uh, what I'm identifying here as Kobe L, with a peak ground acceleration of 0.35 g. Um, after completion of the centrifuge tests, and in order to better understand the experimental results and patterns, we modeled the experiments numerically in 3D. Uh, we use the open seas finite element platform with the pressure dependent multi yield surface soil constitutive model that is one of the main classes of soil models capable of capturing dynamic response of liquefiable soils. The model has many parameters that needed to be calibrated and to account for material behavior at different levels, we optimized model parameters to match first element level monotonic and cyclic triaxial tests that were performed on the soil types of interest. Um, second, empirical relations from case histories in terms of liquefaction resistance for different densities. And third, a boundary value problem in the centrifuge, modeling free field conditions with no structure, uh, with the same soil types and ground motions that were considered later. And the best fitting parameters were identified by minimizing the sum of root mean squared error um, between all numerical results and experimental or field observations equally. In this way, our calibration process considered different loading conditions and drainage complexities. Um, here is a schematic of one of the simulations in 3D showing the boundaries, element type, and degrees of freedom. And um, here very quickly, I'm showing uh, only um, a couple of examples of numerical and centrifuge comparison to make sure um, that you know, we see that the numerical model generally captured the acceleration, peak excess pore pressure, and settlement and tilt response of structures observed experimentally, both with and without mitigation. And this was particularly true when triple uh, SI was involved. And here is a comparison of numerical and experimental results for all structures in terms of, uh, on the left, I'm showing permanent settlement, and on the left, permanent tilt of the foundation. First, showing only isolated structures. This is with or without mitigation. And we see overall, we had a decent numerical prediction of foundation settlement and could capture the trends, but rotation was in some cases underestimated. Um, some of that was likely due to possible interactions between structural models in the centrifuge container, which was not representing truly an isolated condition, as we found out during the numerical simulations later, and more, more on that in a few minutes. Uh, but then bringing in the comparison for adjacent structures into the um, comparisons, we see that tilt predictions improved particularly for cases with triple SI. So with an adjacent building. This is because the numerical model could capture the asymmetrical distribution of stiffness, shear and normal stress, soil softening and deformations that are introduced by triple SI and with mitigation relatively well through, um, and, and, and this, is, this is true, although tilt is still a tough parameter to capture with high precision. Now, let's see what we learned from both experiments and simulations on the impact of triple SI on seismic displacements. So I'm starting with structure soil structure interaction with no mitigation first, and then later we'll be bringing the complexities introduced by mitigation. Let's first review the main mechanisms of displacement and what leads to permanent settlement and rotation in each case of isolated and adjacent conditions. Starting with isolated, when on a liquefiable soil deposit, the isolated structure settles due to volumetric strains, and that itself includes consolidation, sedimentation, and partial drainage. And two, shear or deviatoric strains um, that, are, that include both static and seismic ratcheting. So these are the shear strains that occur in the soil and lead to um, settlement. In addition to downward settlement, even 
symmetric isolated structures that are on uniform soil profiles, hypothetically, often experience a small amount of permanent rotation. And that is due to inertial moments by dynamic loads that are not symmetric. And this asymmetry initially creates an, a bias in, in the accumulation of localized volumetric and shear strains below the foundation. But if the soil layer is perfectly uniform, and the structure itself is perfectly symmetric, theoretically, this rotation should be small. Okay, when we introduce another building, so this is now we are entering the triple SI territory, um, there are a number of forces that change these mechanisms. In addition to the inertial demand exerted by that building, this is due to inertial interaction, we alter the static state of stress in the soil below. In terms of vertical normal um, effective stresses, for example, we get higher stresses in between the two structures. Um, so this is you know, comparing the case with two structures compared to um, the case of an isolated uh, case. Um, we, we start to see um, with greater uh, stresses in between the two structures compared to the soil under the outer edge or compared to the single building due to the overlap of stress bulbs um, in between. And that can lead to differences in shear modulus and therefore uh, shear strain um, across the width of each of these foundations. The soil under the inner edge will have greater shear modulus and resistance to cyclic softening in terms of RU, while the soil under the outer edge at the same elevation will be experiencing greater cyclic softening and strains. And these tendencies would encourage the two structures to rotate slightly outward. Now, if we look at the static shear stresses in the primary plane through the center of the two foundations, um, where we are applying the strongest shaking, I'm referring to that as the XZ plane, um, for an isolated structure, these shear stress contours are symmetric on the two sides of the foundation. But for adjacent buildings, the cancellation of shear stresses with opposite directions uh, under the inner edge leads to larger shear stresses under the outer edge and a greater tendency for shear strains under static and later seismic loading under the outer edge. And this tendency would also encourage an outward rotation for the foundation. On the other hand, let's not forget the problem is three-dimensional. If we look at static shear stresses on the same XZ plane, but acting in the perpendicular direction to shaking, what I'm referring to as tau YZ, again, the distribution is symmetric under an isolated structure, but this time the soil under the inner edge will experience amplified shear stress in the YZ direction through the superposition of shear stresses in the same direction, encouraging shear strains in the out of plane direction that are larger under the inner edge compared to the outer edge. This tendency would essentially encourage an inward rotation of the two structures. So it, it has an opposite effect compared to the previous two mechanisms. Now, which one of these mechanisms ends up dominating the net seismic rotation of the adjacent buildings very much depends on the characteristics of ground shaking, basically the inertial demand, and importantly, the balance among these static, normal, and shear stresses, which are in turn affected by building spacing, that's in relation to foundation width, and dynamic properties. So for the particular conditions of motion in our study, at shorter spacings of around one to three meters, that is um, less than one third of the foundation width, the out of plane shear stresses dominated. And this led to an inward rotation tendency under dynamic loading, as I've shown here in, in, in the picture. While increasing the spacing beyond three meters, again, beyond uh, one third of the width, led to domination of the other mechanisms and, and, and um, a, a change in rotation tendencies from inward to outward. So as we, we increase the spacing, the direction of rotation changed because of the change in balance of these stresses. 
And these rotations were, it goes without saying, were significantly greater than those under an isolated structure that we'll see soon. Some trends that are insightful from our numerical simulations, um, here in this plot with black dashed lines, I'm showing the permanent settlement and tilt of an isolated structure like A. Then with green triangles, the same structure when next to a similar neighbor A. And with the red circles, with the red circles, the same structure when next to a heavy and tall neighbor like B, at different spacings that are normalized by foundation width on the x-axis. And I'm keeping the soil profile and motion consistent in all of these simulations. It appears that triple SI, as you see in the left plot, um, can reduce the foundation's average settlement at shorter spacings by increasing the normal stress and shear stiffness in the soil between foundations, particularly in the presence of a heavier neighbor. And this is, we're talking about a reduction that's not really too much. It's uh, a reduction from about 50 centimeters to 42 centimeters for the particular conditions that we're investigating here. However, triple SI makes up for that slight improvement in settlement by increasing, so looking at tilt, by increasing, um, and uh, this is a significant um, uh, in, uh, increase. I mean, significant because note the y-axis in this plot is in log scale. So by orders of magnitude, amplifying permanent tilt from about, like if I, if I convert this radian to degrees, from about 0 0.05 degrees to 1.5 degrees of tilt. We initially had an increase in rotation, quickly reaching a threshold at about um, a spacing of half the width, after which tilt reduced slightly to eventually approach that of the isolated conditions. That was essentially negligible. But importantly, we observed notable amplifications of tilt at spacings as high as 2.5 width. These interactions can substantially influence tilt for relatively large spacings that, that need to be considered. Now, in terms of accelerations, in the model with similar adjacent structures like A, triple uh, SI had a um, negligible impact on foundation spectral accelerations. Here I'm showing, uh, comparing the spectral acceleration of an isolated uh, structure A with A next to another structure A at different spacings, as, and, and as you see, the spectral acceleration is really not changing uh, with the introduction of another light neighbor at different spacings. It didn't make a, a difference. However, in model with uh, the heavier uh, and, and um, the taller neighbor B, an amplification uh, in foundation spectral accelerations was observed in periods ranging from about uh, 0.2 to 1 second at, at a short spacing. Um, this is what I'm showing here is at the, at the spacing of one meter, which is due to the greater confining stress introduced by adjacent B, increasing the soil's shear stiffness. So this is not really the impact of inertial interaction, but is the result of the change in confining pressure by introducing a heavy neighbor. The impact of B on A's acceleration became negligible at greater spacing. So you see the, the pink response spectrum is approaching the gray. Um, that means when we started to exceed spacings of about 2.5 foundation width, um, the spectral accelerations approach that of the isolated condition. Um, nevertheless, the acceleration response of the heavier structure dealing B was not impacted by the presence of the lighter neighbor. So this effect was mainly from the heavy structure onto the light neighbor in terms of acceleration. While evaluating triple SI in addition to two adjacent structures, we considered six different building configurations with spacings ranging from one to nine meters that are shown here uh, as different uh, cluster shapes. In general, multiple triple SI was expected to alter some of the de deformation mechanisms by first increasing or decreasing the stress bias below the foundations in three dimensions, and uh, two, potentially changing the flow path in, in 3D. 
uh, looking at one example of a square shape configuration, um, generally the bias in normal and shear stress uh, was amplified compared to the case of two adjacent structures, which encouraged a greater rotation um, in, in this configuration. Now, similar to the case of two structures, at a spacing of one meter, corner structures tended to rotate inward to the cluster center. And as spacing, as spacing increased to nine meters, the orientation of corner structures shifted uh, uh, to an outward direction um, due to the change in the balance of normal and shear stress biases that we discussed previously. So the same logic really applied to um, building clusters. And interestingly, in this trend um, happened to be in line with some of the observations that were documented in Tokyo Bay Area during the 2011 Tohoku earthquake by Yasuda and colleagues. There was really no explanation given about this shift in the direction of rotation, uh, but we were able to see that um, and confirm that both experimentally and numerically in our simulations. Now, let's see how a mitigation technique around one structure may change or amplify some of these mechanisms. Um, so this is now entering the territory of mitigation, adding mitigation on top of triple SI. We want to see how mitigation changes or amplifies some of these mechanisms by um, first looking at results from uh, two specific centrifuge experiments. Let's just focus on the experimental results um, for simplicity and with two similar adjacent structures like A. In one test, we used no mitigation and in the other, we had drains or PVDs placed around the perimeter of the north structure. And instead of delta U or excess pore pressures, I'll show the time history of dynamic vertical effective stress as calculated as the initial effective stress minus delta U that's obtained from our pore pressure measurements. And I'm showing this because the vertical effective stress time history is a direct measure of strength loss uh, over time in our granular soils. So it's, it's insightful to look at it that way. It's kind of a reverse way. Um, this effective vertical stress that I'm showing here, uh, first at the center of structure A uh, with no mitigation, uh, didn't exactly reach zero due to the confining pressure uh, that's provided by, by the building at its center, underneath its center. Now, uh, they were slightly greater in the center of the structure with PVDs uh, because PVDs, these drains, were only placed around the perimeter of the foundation. So they were only slightly effective in uh, reducing the excess pore pressures at the center. But they helped a little bit. Now, look, looking at the edges of the two buildings, for the one without PVDs, sigma Z prime of vertical effective stress was slightly greater under the inner edge of structures initially, dropped below the outer edge temporarily, but regained its value soon after shaking due to greater confinement in between the structures. But for the second test on the right, note that in general, the PVDs were quite successful in reducing the degree of strength loss during dynamic loading around the edges of the foundation of the mitigated structure. So these are uh, locations very close to the drains. We have really reduced the degree of strength loss, reduced the degree of excess pore pressure generation, and that, that should help that one building. But now looking at the unmitigated structure neighbor in each pair. The results were roughly similar for this structure where no mitigation was employed at all, but a drastic difference is now observed for the two sides of the structure that had a mitigated neighbor. Due to this asymmetry provided by adjacent drains, this rather extreme change and um, asymmetry in effective stress during dynamic loading has drastic, drastic effects on uh, shear stiffness strains and the tilt potential of this poor neighbor. Um, let's see how these pore pressures impacted the um, settlement and tilt patterns. This is the settlement tilt behavior 
um, of the unmitigated pair um, that you see here experienced large settlements and about 0.5 to uh, 1 degree of rotation. So these are the two neighbors that are not mitigated. Um, and these are not too different from each other. Neither one is mitigated. Um, now, adding drains around the perimeter of the north structure greatly reduced its settlement and permanent tilt. So permanent tilt is close to zero, but it, it amplified its transient rotation by increasing its transverse and rotational accelerations, as we'll see later. Transient rotation can be dangerous. It can lead to pounding on an adjacent structure if closely spaced, but for the uh, particular experiment that I'm showing here, that did not happen for the properties and the spacing in question. Now, importantly, the presence of drains uh, around the north structure reduced the settlement of the south neighbor um, to some extent, while greatly amplifying its rotation. This is, this is the unmitigated neighbor. Um, we amplified its rotation uh, up to around four times uh, compared to the unmitigated case. Um, and this can be quite damaging. And, and the different experiments uh, showed the net magnitude and orientation of foundation rotation are strongly sensitive not only to the type and spacing of structures that we saw previously when we were just looking at triple SI, but also the properties and geometry of the mitigation technique employed that can really play an important role in how much and in what direction structures rotate. How does mitigation alter the transverse accelerations transferred to the foundation and superstructure? Here, um, I'm showing the um, Stockwell plot of foundation accelerations showing intensity with colors ranging from blue to red frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. The PGA is also recorded at the top right. And I'm also showing the first two modal frequencies of the structure with dashed horizontal lines for context. Um, the accelerations that were transferred to the foundation on a soil profile that has experienced um, liquefaction typically um, show a strong damping and reduction in higher frequency motions early in the record as seen here. You see the high frequency stuff really get damped out very quickly. And for the most part, we don't have a lot of accelerations remaining, some in the lower frequency range. And this is the case uh, for both structures that are uh, unmitigated and next to each other. When we add drains around one structure, we start to see amplification of accelerations uh, across a range of frequencies in the first 15 seconds, not only for the mitigated uh, structure, but also on the uh, poor unmitigated neighbor uh, almost equally. And, and that amplification of seismic demand uh, can have implications in the superstructure. If we measure performance in terms of bending strains, as I'm showing here on the beam and column fuses, we see a notable increase, especially on column strains for both structures A, when one of them was mitigated. So this increase was okay for structure A because its strength and yield capacity was high and we were still within its yield limit. But that was not the case when we tested a weaker and taller structure with nine stories next to uh, you know, place, uh, nine stories placed next to uh, building A that was mitigated. For example, this is the time history of strains on the column, column fuse of building B when no mitigation was used around its neighbor A. You see the range of bending strains on the column. And here is the um, uh, strain on B when PVDs were added around A. The permanent strain increased by a factor of six. And here the adjacent unmitigated structure B yielded and eventually collapsed due to the mitigation of the uh, building next door. Now, looking at numerical predictions of tilt for adjacent structures at different spacings, when adding different types of mitigation around one neighbor, uh, 
um, densification. So here I'm going to look at three uh, kinds of mitigation. One is uh, densification alone. Um, two, densification combined with PVDs or drains only around the perimeter. And three, densification combined with full PVDs underneath and all around the building. We investigate the impact of, uh, of these mitigation techniques on tilt only uh, for both mitigated and unmitigated neighbor for different building spacings. And here I'm uh, normalizing the spacing uh, with uh, the building width on the x-axis. And here I'm showing with the red thin horizontal line the design limit for tilt. This is assuming 1 over 300 radians or uh, about 0.2 degrees. And uh, the black dashed line is how uh, each of these two structures, like A, rotate when adjacent to another um, building A at different spacings, showing the impact of triple SI alone without any mitigation. So as we saw earlier, rotation increased at shorter spacings up to a spacing of around half a width, um, reaching a peak after which it reduced to eventually approach the case of an isolated structure A. Uh, when we add mitigation, particularly stronger and more extensive mitigation, like combined densification with full drainage with green crosses, we greatly improve the tilt and um, the tilt of the mitigated structure. You see in the right plot, even down to the isolated case and design limit very quickly. Uh, but we um, simultaneously greatly amplify the tilt of an unmitigated neighbor, particularly at these shorter spacings. Now, focusing on the dimensions of densification around one structure, we show in addition to depth, densification width beyond the foundation edge was critical in reducing its tilt to acceptable levels. So here in this plot with the dashed lines, I'm showing um, the tilt of an isolated structure a, and this is the tilt of, an, uh, of A with an unmitigated neighbor A. Um, and we, we showed that we need densification width um, greater than about um, three meters, and this is about one third of the foundation width, to reduce the tilt to acceptable levels. This is for the mitigated structure, for all densification depths considered. So, uh, one thing that was really critical for reducing tilt of the foundation was increasing the width of densification. Um, it wasn't as sensitive to the depth. However, looking at the effect on the unmitigated neighbor, um, both increasing the depth and width of densification around one structure strongly amplified the rotation of the unmitigated neighbor particularly when the densification width approached the spacing. Um, this is a spacing between the structures in this particular case, essentially reaching the edge of the neighboring building. So in conclusion, overall from um, this study, we learned that triple SI and seismic coupling among structures slightly reduce foundation settlement while greatly amplifying and uh, changing direction uh, of rotation compared to isolated SSI, depending on spacing, foundation width, structure's dynamic properties, and uh, motion properties. The impact of triple SI on rotation remained notable even for spacings as high as 2.5 times foundation width. But this impact was negligible on settlement and spectral accelerations at, at such um, spacings. Presence of a heavy structure at shorter spacings amplified spectral accelerations on the shorter structure, mostly due to the impact on confining pressure and shear stiffness in the soil below rather than inertial interaction. And the reverse was not true. The lighter structure did not impact the accelerations on the heavier structure. These patterns may be amplified in larger clusters with three or more buildings, depending on 
the building properties and their spatial arrangement. Okay, now adding mitigation, particularly combined and stronger methods around one structure that experiences triple SI can severely increase the rotation and seismic demand in unmitigated neighbors, particularly when reaching their edge, potentially causing damage and collapse. So ground improvement in general with any mechanism of mitigation needs to be designed with extreme care in urban settings, considering the overall stability and performance of the entire soil foundation structure system in a cluster or perhaps a city block rather than one isolated system. Now, moving forward, there is need for a better understanding of the system response under more complex and realistic conditions. For example, interlayering, stratigraphic and spatial variability, and fines. Um, fines content in particular non-plastic fines makes um, uh, ap the application and efficiency of many traditional liquefaction mitigation techniques uh, and modern uh, mitigation complicated. And, and we are trying to study some of these challenges in our physical models while simultaneously exploring innovative and environmentally friendly mitigation strategies that improve the performance of the soil foundation structure system holistically. Uh, another complication, particularly in Central and Eastern United States, that may be um, more applicable to um, many of you, which experience seismic hazards but to a lower degree, is the possibility of multi-hazards or hazards that are cascading in their occurrence or in terms of their impact. For example, the sequence of um, drought, flood, and earthquake. Such conditions can lead to ground failure and potential liquefaction in soil layers that are normally not considered liquefiable, even put, for example, partially saturated, at lower levels of seismicity that we would expect normally. And this could potentially lead to substantial damage. And we are hoping to fundamentally study the coupled thermohydraulic seismic response of soils that are variably saturated in order to better um, be equipped to assess and improve seismic performance um, in a changing climate across the US. So these are some research topics that are coming up in my uh, group, but I would love to hear from all of you as well on challenges in your practice related to granular soils, earthquakes, and other hazards in urban areas that we in academia should pay more attention to. Um, thank you very much for your time, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions uh, or hear your ideas and recommendations. Uh, Professor, a uh, very interesting uh, presentation, uh, very, very good uh, presented. Uh, so before we get to the Q&A section, we just need to go through some uh, PDH evaluation questions. Um, so let's get to the first one. Um, so the influence of the uh, triple SI on the uh, amount and direction of the building rotation depends on uh, what factor spacing, building properties, foundation size, or all of the, uh, the above. So I think, you know, we got almost 80% people uh, cast a vote. Uh, yeah, and the answer, of course, it's the, all of the above. Um, Professor, you, you wanna, you have anything to add to this question or? No, that's it. All right, cool. Let's move to the next one then. Uh, so the ground movement influence, um, you know, triple SI through, you know, a um, decreasing settlement and tilt uh, of both labor structures, or um, b increasing settlement or uh, of both structures or C, uh, decreasing tilt of a uh, mitigated structure, but increasing the tilt of an unmitigated uh, neighbor structure, uh, or uh, decreasing spectral acceleration at the building's uh, fundamental model. The, the last one is fundamental mode. A mode, sorry. <laughs> that, was, that was my fault. So I have seen almost 70, 80% voted. We have a little bit division on this one. Uh, almost 30% people choose uh, answer A, uh, about 50% um, uh, 
uh, people uh, choose fifty percent people choose the uh, right answer C. Um, so the correct answer should be C. Uh, Professor, you you have anything to add to this question? Yeah, so it, it's very important to, to remember that uh, adding mitigation around one structure, it can really hurt the neighbor in terms of tilt. So we, we can significantly amplify the tilt of the unmitigated neighbor. Gotcha. All right, and let's move to the next one. Um, so uh, the adverse effect of ground uh, densification on tilt uh, of adjacent structure is worst when A, uh, the densification width is about one third of the building spacing, B is about two thirds of the building spacing, um, C is uh, equal to the building spacing, or the D um, uh, is equal to 2.5 uh, times the building spacing. So I've, I've seen we got almost 70% uh, voted. Uh, again, I, I haven't seen some divisions on you know on, on this one. Or or most one third people choose A, one third people um, uh, choose D, and there's like a evenly um, um, uh, distribute between B and C. Seems to have a lot of uh, 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 um, uh, verification on the answer for this one. But I believe the correct answer is C, right, uh, Professor? Yeah, so this is this is when densification width uh, reaches the neighbor when when it's equal to building spacing. Um, the densification around one building reaches the edge of the neighbor. That's when the adverse effect on the tilt of that neighbor becomes maximum. Got you. Got you. Thanks for the clarification. Um, let's move to the next one. Um, so again, the triple SI can affect the tilt of adjacent structure uh, for spacing as high as uh, A is one third building weights, uh, two is two building weight, uh, two times building weights, and C is equal to building weights, and uh, D is 2.5 times building weights. So I've seen almost 80% of the audience have uh, voted. Uh, it seems like a majority of the audience choose the right answer, which is D. About half the uh, people choose that answer, but there's uh, some other um, you know, divisions between um, answer A, B, and C, but the correct answer is D. So Professor, you have anything to add for this question? Yeah, I, I mean, we, we just found this so fascinating because in many of our experiments, we assume that we don't have any um, interaction when we are at 2.5 um, with spacing, whereas we saw significant effects on tilt at, at that level of uh, spacing. So even as large as 2.5 width, we can have seismic interactions, and that, that shows up in terms of tilt, but not other aspects of the response. Gotcha. All right, cool. Let's go get to the last question before we get to the Q&A. Um, so um, question number five, which one of these statements is true on the liquefiable soils during an earthquake? A is two uh, adjacent structures always rotated away from each other. B is not two adjacent structure always rotated toward to each other. And C is structure always settle more in a cluster uh, compared to compared to in isolation um, um, a state. Or uh, D is corner structure always rotated more in a cluster compared to um, 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 isolation. So we have almost 80% uh, people voted. Interesting, uh, majority of the people choose the um, uh, choose answer C, and uh, about one quarter people choose answer D, which I believe is the correct answer, right, uh, Professor? Yeah, yeah. So the, I mean, the, the impact is confusing. In, in fact, triple SI tends to reduce settlement. So that uh, option C is is incorrect, even though I mean it is confusing because one thinks okay things get worse, 
But no, in terms of settlement, things actually get better. Um, what gets much worse is um, rotation, and that really hurts the corner structures in a cluster. Got you. All right. Um, um, very good. Thank, thank you so much, Professor. Again, you know, we, we do have a few questions from the audience. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, we probably can, you know, take uh, take a few of them. So the first question is really, um, please, uh, please explain the effect of distance versus consolidation. Um, that question clear. <laughs> yeah, please explain the effect of what versus consolidation. Distance versus consolidation. I, mm -hmm. I guess that's probably re regarding with one of your uh, when you're talking about you know the distance, the spacing from the structure. You know how would that you know impact on consolidation? I guess. Okay. But that, not... So you mean <laughs> like uh, as as we maybe by distance um, they mean um, spacing, spacing between how does spacing between structures affect the degree of consolidation, consolidation-induced volumetric strains? Is that, could that be? That, that, that would be my guess. Um, but yeah, the question is really not, not very clear. Yeah, I think what happens when two buildings are very close to each other? Um, where, you know, if you remember the um, distribution of vertical effective stress, the, the, um, the stress contours, um, they increase in between the two structures. Um, and increasing the vertical effective stresses at shorter spacings uh, typically leads to a, a reduction in the degree of strength loss in terms of RU. RU has implications in terms of the, the level of volumetric strains that we expect in the soil. There are different kinds of volumetric strains. One of them is consolidation. In granular soils, consolidation is not really a significant problem. It's mostly, mm -hmm. when we look at the volumetric component of settlement, it's mostly sedimentation and partial drainage that contribute. And they can be impacted by, um, if, if we reduce the RU, sedimentation reduces. If we reduce the degree of excess pore pressure generation, volumetric strains due to uh, partial drainage can also reduce. So some of these effects are what led to a reduction in the total settlement of the building as we had uh, structures closely spaced next to each other. So this interaction and closer spacing led to greater uh, vertical effective stresses that reduce the degree of volumetric strains for the most part. Um, but there's also shear strains and they affect tilt and what really got hurt in this uh, con uh, context of urban settings is the rotation and tilt of the structure um, that is more, more affected by shear strains rather than volumetric strains like consolidation. I hope that answered the question. I hope so. Uh, but I mean, next question is really more like a, a big picture question, um, general question. You know, we, uh, you know, I think most of the audience on, uh, audience on this lecture is really uh, geotechnic engineering practitioners. Uh, you know, I heard from the start of the speech, you, you uh, specific side, you know, uh, typically, you know, more, more for the building code, doing like the fashion hazard analysis, everything. We really consider free uh, field conditions, everything, right? You know, or, or your uh, research there, I feel like a very uh, cutting edge, but, you know, from a practitioner point of view, how do you see this research being, you know, incorporated into the practice, you know? Um, you know, is something would be incorporated in building code, you know, have to consider that for future uh, designs or, you know, how, how you know, uh, like a general, general speaking, how would you provide guidance for geotech engineering practitioners, especially, you know, I think your research really uh, associated with urban environment, you know, as you can see, you know, for New York City, you know, not probably one of the concerns so we, we would have, you know, some of your research there seems very uh, applicable. Uh, to New York City uh, area, but uh, how would uh, you know we as uh, practitioners, engineers, you know, included in, in this into our you know daily practice? Yeah, very very good question. Um, I think at least what what I mean at the minimum what we should do in practice is using existing probabilistic procedures that account for soil structure interaction. The procedures that I showed at the beginning of the presentation, 
um, that we've put together. These are uh, actually, let, let me point to the publications related to that procedure. It's these two, Bullock et al. Um, uh, there is a geotechnic paper and an ASC uh, paper that basically give give a probabilistic model for estimating the settlement and tilt of the building, um, taking into account soil structure interaction. This doesn't in include seismic coupling, but at least it's a huge improvement to some of the other procedures that ignore the structure altogether. They're probabilistic, they're, uh, they've been calibrated with a large number of centrifuge and field observations. Um, and they can work in different kinds of tectonic environments. And we've also developed spreadsheets. If you if you email me, I put my email address over here. Um, I can uh, point you to my website. On the website, we have shared the spreadsheets where you can basically enter your soil profile in terms of CPT or SPT in building dimensions, kind of like the next generation ground motion prediction equations. We have set set things up for you to be able to obtain the fragility curves for probability of exceeding a certain level of settlement or tilt or a combination of the two. So that's a huge improvement to the current state of practice in many parts of the country that completely ignore a structure. For the next level that is in urban settings, we don't have a modification to our procedures yet, unfortunately. It takes many more simulations and, and more um, documented case histories to make modifications to our procedures for the conditions in a cluster. But my, my goal with this presentation is to draw attention to the fact that, you know, if we ignore the surrounding structures, we can really hurt them. And it can really lead to the damage of especially weaker, stru weaker structures in the neighbor that are not mitigated. We can amplify their accelerations. We can uh, amplify their tilt. We can amplify their column strains, potentially even leading to their collapse if we don't think of mitigation and ground improvement at a systems level. So my recommendation right now for practice is to um, if possible, to uh, think about mitigation at a larger systems level than individual buildings. In terms of the building code, we are not even close to making those kinds of um, uh, justifications and, and, and requirements in the building code because our knowledge is still not robust and we, we don't have modifications to our procedures to, to really enforce in practice. But I think at least this knowledge of how much interaction matters um, may affect how we approach the design, even without simplified procedures or the code um, regulating things. Great. Um, yeah, uh, Professor, thank you so much. That, that, that's a great answer to my question. So uh, we're already uh, a few minutes over um, over seven. So I will see we'll probably need to adjourn the, um, the seminar tonight. Again, you know, very interesting topic, a very great, great uh, presentation. I think you shared your contact information. So if you, if the audience, you know, everybody have any uh, follow-up question, please feel free to reach out to prof professor or reach out to me. I can share uh, professor's, you know, uh, um, uh, contact information. Again, thank you so much um, for the presentation tonight. Um, you know, on behalf of our SCE Med Section Joe Institute chapter, um, or thank you so much for your presentation. And, uh, you know, for all the audience, uh, thank you so much for attending tonight. Uh, we'll see you in, in, in next event. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. All right. Have a good night.